Hello everyone, uh, today we're going to talk about happy or silent hypoxia in COVID. Uh, this is uh, one condition which has been perplexing everyone uh, for a long time. Now someone who is hypoxic, you will see them, they are very anxious and uh, they they are they can't sometimes even vocalize uh, what they are going through it is a well frightening uh, experience for most patients but unlike uh, the normal patients the covid patients are nearly you know in a normal state they are calm and uh, they can you know converse with you normally and uh, that is uh, what perplexes everyone the patient has got a saturation of 70% and in normal situation uh, not only will the panic, patient panic even the clinicians panic but these patients are cool they are actually able to have normal conversation and they have no sign of anxiety at all and so in normal hypoxia and uh, when hypoxia happened it's a normal tendency uh, for the stimulation of the central chemoreceptors and peripheral chemoreceptors and we start hyperventilating. Now if you look at the airway industry and uh, when there is actually this uh, uh, hostesses in the uh, airplane uh, they are actually before the takeoff and uh, they're talking about the safety issues they will always say that uh, if there is a drop in the cabin pressure and the oxygen mask will drop and you need to place the cabin at the oxygen mask before you actually help anyone and the reason for that is very simple because when hypoxia occur at altitude the oxygen levels actually can drop very quickly and that can lead to unconsciousness now for this it's very important to understand the alveolar gas equation alveolar gas equation is called to PiO2. PiO2 is basically your barometric pressure minus the water vapor pressure into the FiO2 minus the PaCO2 by R, the respiratory quotient. Respiratory quotient is 0 0.8. So if a barometric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury with water pressure of minus 47, that is 47 millimeters of mercury and FiO2 0.21 and assuming the CO2 levels are normal at 40, uh, then what we have PaO2 is around 150 minus 50 that's around 108 uh, millimeters of mercury. Now if you are actually flying at the altitude of uh, say Mount Everest and the uh, uh, barometric pressure there is 240 and if you are still breathing uh, in a normal oxygen and your CO2 are normal your alveolar uh, partial pressure can be negative minus 10 Yes, minus 10. That means you can't just breathe. You are going to become unconscious uh, within seconds. The oxygen cannot live. But if you at least start, say, hyperventilating at that altitude and you hyperventilate to a CO2 of 20, then in that case, your PaO2 is 40 minus 25. That's 15. So still you have some amount of gradient. That's not enough oxygen still, but at least you're not in negative. So in the COVID-19 patients, what uh, is seen is the SpO2 can be as low as 60%, uh, which equates to PO2 almost 70 millimeters of mercury. They maintain a subnormal PaCO2, so there is no hyperventilation. The CO2 is sort of uh, just below the normal, so it's around 35, 32, 35, 37 millimeters of mercury. And there is poor responsiveness to supplemental oxygen. And despite the low SpO2, consciousness is normally maintained. The patients are coherent. So that is what is perplexing the, uh, you know, our physicians looking after these patients. So these are uh, some of the ABGs sent by our members. So uh, thank you to all of you who have sent all the blood gases. I've only used few of them for this purpose. So if you look at this blood gas, the PO2 is low, 67.3, but the PCO2 is 30.2, 38.2. That's normal CO2. Okay, so that normal wouldn't happen because this hypoxia it will stimulate uh, your peripheral chemoreceptors and I make you hyperventilate. 
Uh, again, another uh, blood gas, PO2 60.6, but the PCO2 is 30.4. Here, the PO2 is 67.3, PCO30.52. Okay. So the key to conundrum here is carbon dioxide, not oxygen. Okay, so that is the whole issue here. It is the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide. Okay. So if you look at the cerebral blood flow, uh, one of the factors uh, which maintains uh, the uh, normal cerebral blood flow or affect the cerebral blood flow or the cerebral perfusion pressure is the local vessel constrictors and dilators. Okay. And of that, one of the most important one is the carbon dioxide. So hypoxia can lead to unconsciousness, and this occurs because of low PaCO2, which causes cerebral passive constriction. Okay. But this does not happen in COVID patients. And this is thanks to Yogesh uh, Ramasamy. Uh, he sent me this image of a patient with hypoxia happy hypoxia. You can see this patient has got a saturation of 61%. His heart rate is 97, so he's got a bit tachycardia, but his blood pressure is maintained, very well maintained. Okay, And that is the thing with uh, the happy hypoxia. So if you look at uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, autoregulation, cerebral autoregulation, and look at the effect of PaCO2, and uh, the normal cerebral blood flow is 50 ml per 100 gram per minute. And uh, this is actually maintained at the normal level. So when your CO2 actually goes down, your cerebral blood flow will normally decrease. Okay. But in COVID patient, because the CO2 is now maintained in subnormal levels, so just below the normal levels, okay, your cerebral blood flow is maintained throughout. And that is why these patients are actually hyp no, are hypoxic, but still very coherent. Their the blood flow to the to the brain is being maintained. So uh, there is no hypoxia occurring at the cerebral level. The oxygen is being delivered. All the nutrients are being delivered uh, to the brain. Okay. The increase in heart rate is important here to maintain the cardiac output. And the arterial pressure. Okay, so stroke volume is maintained, heart rate is maintained. So, the the higher heart rate will likely, uh, you know, maintain the cardiac output even if there is reduction in some amount of stroke volume. Arterial pressure is maintained throughout, and this is important for maintaining the cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, which is equal to mean arterial pressure minus ICP or CVP, whichever is higher. Okay, so. Mean arterial pressure are maintained, and so is the cerebral perfusion pressure in these cases. So brain lysis is a highly metabolic, has high metabolic activity, and because the uh, cerebral blood flow is maintained, and so is the delivery of the all the nutrient, whether it's glucose or lipid soluble substances which are used uh, by the brain uh, for energy, uh, they are maintained. So normally hypoxia should lead to decrease in the aerobic metabolism and uh, also affects the local CO2 prediction. But there is no accumulation of CO2 in COVID patients, and that is because there is cerebral uh, vasodilation or with the cerebral blood flow is maintained. Okay. And because cerebral blood flow is maintained, the CO2 is easily washed out. Okay. So there is no you know, accumulation of CO2 or uh, you know, marked reduction in CO2 levels. Uh, so if you look at the various substances, the uptake of oxygen, glucose, glutamate uh, is in positive, whereas the carbon dioxide is output is uh, okay increased. So there is always uh, increase in CO2 level. Uh, it's uh, uh, produced at greater uh, level than what is it, uh, you know, than the compared to other substances. Uh, so when it says it's negative, that means there is a output uh, of CO2 from the brain. So uh, that is important to maintain maintain the uh, you know the auto automaticity of the respiration. So increase in CO2 and uh, that combines with water it forms carbonic acid which is dissociated to hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. And it is the hydrogen ions that stimulate the respiratory center uh, which are present on the ventral surface or ventral lateral medulla oblongata. Okay. So 
increase increase in CO2 should uh, stimulate the respiratory rate and uh, so you do actually see some amount of uh, uh, even though the CO2 is maintained with subnormal level there is uh, patients breathing uh, at increased rate so we all know from all these graphs that how the CO2 actually uh, increases the respiratory rate as the CO2 increases so does the uh, your respiratory rate uh, this may not be important, but this is what I was actually explaining about uh, when the barometric pressure actually goes down, the alveolar CO, the PaO2 goes down, but the CO2 production doesn't. That is actually maintained. So uh, they can come to almost same level as uh, the barometric uh, pressure is, is, is reduced. So if you look at uh, the uh, uh, PaO2, uh, and a CO2 relation uh, with the ventilation. Uh, so if you look at the CO2 happening and uh, the respiratory response at PO2 of 55, okay. So obviously it will go go up. And uh, so normally at PO2 of 100, which is normal, and CO2 of 40, the respiratory rate is maintained around 12 to 14 per minute. Uh, but a lower PO2 will stimulate. Uh, the respiration and if they appear to go further lower down there is further stimulation of respiration and I've explained how that is actually used to improve the PaO2 so if you look at the uh, alveolar partial pressure oxygen uh, which is equal to PiO2 into FiO2 minus PaCO2 by R so if a PaCO2 actually goes down then your uh, the uh, you know, ratio, so PA2 by R will also be reduced. So it will come down from 50 to say 25 if your PSU comes down from 40 to 20. Thank you. So that's very important to understand. This is just another graph showing the same thing uh, that uh, when the PO2 of 60 and the PCO2 of 70, the respiratory rate is around, you know, normalish. And as the uh, uh, PO2 is low and CO2 uh, goes up, the respiratory rate should actually increase. So by increasing the CO2, you can actually increase the ventilation uh, response. And this is important when actually I'm talking about the treatment in these COVID uh, patients. Okay, If you increase it further, you can still increase the uh, respiratory response. So ventilation can increase and uh, you can actually wash out more CO2. Okay. So we also know that uh, uh, when uh, there is uh, changes happening in the lungs, okay, and there is hypoxemia, uh, then the carotid bodies are stimulated, okay, and uh, same thing happens at the uh, because the CO2 uh, increases, there is uh, acidosis, and this uh, increase in the uh, uh, you know hydrogen ions or reduction in the pH of the CSF, and that stimulates the central chemoreceptors. So patients actually will uh, become breathless. You can actually make out that. Uh, if somebody comes to you walking in a hypoxic state, you can make out uh, that the patient is actually breathless. They all have a, the air hunger and they are very anxious. Uh, some of them, they can't even speak in sentences. And it affects the emotions. So the limbic drive is also affected. And, uh, and that is very apparent uh, in these patients. But what happens in the uh, happy hypoxia? Okay, in happy, happy hypoxia, the carotid bodies, the peripheral chemoreceptor are desensitized. So even though the oxygen is markedly reduced, they are not able to send signals uh, to the respiratory center to increase the respiratory rate. Okay. And the central chemoreceptors are depressed so even if the CO2 is increased, and even if there is increase in the uh, you know hydrogen ion concentration or reduction in pH, then again there is no uh, you know stimulation of the respiration, but patients are still happy. Okay. So when the uh, PO2 is down to around 70 millimeters of mercury, normally there is increased. Uh, you know, output uh, from the uh, carotid bodies. And this can be seen in the diagram. So when you can actually see that as the PO2 is on the right side, the impulses generated are actually markedly reduced. 
But as the PO2 actually starts going down below 100 milliliters of mercury, the impulses generation increases markedly. The firing uh, from the carrier and aortic body actually increases. So the peripheral chemoreceptors, uh, which are present in the carotid body, uh, send their signal through the glossopharyngeal nerve. So what is the putative mechanism of hypo, uh, the happy hypoxia? Okay. So in hypo, happy hypoxia, even though uh, you actually see the changes, people who have done the uh, uh, CT scans, uh, they will see that there is a ground, a ground glass consolidation. Uh, and there is uh, some amount of edema, and uh, this leads to pulmonary shunting. Okay, and we know that when pulmonary shunting occurs, there can be marked reduction in the oxygen uh, oxygenation. The PO2 will drop, and uh, the there will be subnormal CO2 levels. As uh, okay, but what happens in the COVID-19 patients? Okay, so there is like I said, one there is desensitization of the carotid body, that is the peripheral chemoreceptors. Okay. So because of that, uh, there is uh, suboptimal uh, ventilation. Patient is not actually ventilating. They are have shallow, rapid breathing. Okay. They might actually have cyanosis, a peripheral cyanosis. But these patients do not have dyspnea. There is no anxiety. There is no confusion. Okay, and why is that? Because even though the uh, 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 the central chemoreceptor are depressed, there is decreased drive, there is decreased uh, brain PCO2, the cerebral blood flow is preserved. Okay, so even the presence of severe hypoxemia, the reduction in CO2 is not seen. Okay, so there is no reduction in the cerebral blood flow. The cerebral blood flow is preserved, and that is what lead to this, uh, you know, no confusion, no dyspnea, no anxiety. The patient is actually happy, and that is why this is known as happy hypoxia. Okay. There is obviously, there is some amount of the stimulation of the stretch receptors in the lungs from the uh, edema, and uh, this can increase the, moderately increase the respiratory rate uh, to approximately around 30 to 30 per minute. So that's why you actually see these patients who have shallow, rapid respiration. Uh, okay. So this is all about tricking the sensors, isn't it? COVID tricks the sensors. And how do they do? First of all, they do by hijacking the peripheral chemoreceptors. So they are not allowing and uh, uh, chemoreceptors in the carotid body just to fire off. Okay. There is also some role of uh, the hypoxic inducible factors. So uh, normally the uh, hypoxic inducible factors are rapidly uh, disintegrated, but in hypoxia, and they actually get incorporated and they actually cause a lot of other uh, things. So this is more for chronic hypoxia, uh, but it is also actually uh, releasing the hypoxic responsive element, HRAs. Uh, in long term, it will actually obviously cause angiogenesis, uh, erythropoiesis, uh, changes in metabolism. Uh, but in uh, the, uh, uh, you know, in COVID, uh, there is actually uh, hypoxic, uh, the uh, you know, um, factor inducible factors uh, may be down regulated. So, this is one of the theories uh, which has been postulated that there is down regulation uh, of the hypoxic inducible factors. And so, we are not able to actually see uh, the normal changes which actually happen with hypoxia uh, at the tissue levels or at the central level. Second thing is that we all know that uh, uh, COVID is uh, neurotoxic and uh, this has been evidenced uh, by the loss of smell and taste. Uh, so it is affecting uh, your olfactory bulb. And uh, more so important is our, uh, the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay. So the respiratory center uh, get input from the carotid body through the glossopharyngeal nerve, the same nerve uh, which actually is responsible for the taste, also carries signal uh, from the uh, peripheral chemoreceptors. Okay. 
So it goes through the petrosal ganglia. So both the nerves uh, can pass through petrosal uh, ganglia. And hence, uh, there is, uh, you know, loss of uh, taste uh, seen uh, in the uh, COVID patients. So basically, there is dysfunction of the peripheral chemoreceptors. And uh, this leads to mediocre hyperventricular response and maintenance of PaCO2. And it is this maintenance of PaCO2 which is important here because it tries to maintain the cerebral blood flow. At the same time, we have also seen that the uh, mean arterial pressure is maintained uh, by the uh, increase in the heart rate. Okay, so uh, the cardiac output is maintained, the blood pressure is maintained, the cerebral blood flow maintained, and so is the cerebral perfusion pressure. So patients actually do not actually see and the changes which is normally seen in hypoxia. There is also said that there is actually some changes happening in diffusion. We have seen, obviously it happening, uh, we see the ground glass appearance, uh, oxygen cannot diffuse, uh, and there is also some theory that saying that the dissociation, or oh, sorry, oxidation, association of oxygen with hemoglobin, and uh, that is also affected. Okay, there may be slight movement of uh, the the uh, uh, shift of the oxygen dissolution curve to the left uh, to increase uh, the uh, you know oxygen uptake by the hemoglobin, uh, but this is uh, uh, you know um, out balanced by the shunts uh, which are seen uh, because of the ground glass opacities uh, happening in the uh, lung level. Okay, so there is increased amount of shunting uh, which is actually going on. Uh, and this can lead to hypoxia. So we all understand that shunts are not good. Uh, they will actually cause admixture of the, uh, uh, you know, the deoxygenated hemoglobin with oxygenated hemoglobin. But it has also been seen that there is something else going on at the capillary level. So there is uh, microfibrinous clotting uh, within the alveolar capillaries. Uh, there is endotheliitis uh, happening there. And it has been also postulated, like I said, there is reduced affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So in combination of all this, there is hypoxia happening, uh, which is a fact. Okay. So how are we going to treat this? Okay. Is there any treatment available? Uh, yes, we people have been treating uh, this happy, happy hypoxia. And uh, they actually see that... Uh, uh, the patients, uh, you know, are given oxygen and they think, why the hell do we need oxygen? We feel fine, uh, but they do need oxygen. They need it to be supplied oxygen. And uh, using the high-flow oxygen therapy, uh, the high-flow nasal oxygen uh, therapy, uh, non-invasive ventilation, okay, these are uh, very, very important, okay. And... Uh, one of the things that uh, has obviously been seen uh, with the, uh, you know, electrical impedance tomography is that there's alveolar recruitment which happens uh, with use of high flow oxygen. CO2 washout is uh, probably not that much of a issue. We not at least uh, washing out CO2 is not good actually. So uh, we don't want that CO2 is actually required in the therapy. And I will actually talk about that in a minute. So non-invasive uh, non ventilation pro and prone positioning uh, has been used. And uh, it has been seen that uh, this can be done even at home. Okay, So uh, even if you are not actually using uh, the high flow oxygen, uh, just using oxygen uh, via uh, face mask or nasal uh, oxygen cannula, and uh, prone uh, positioning the patients uh, improves the oxygenation. And even when they are actually back to supine position, it is seen that oxygenation is maintained for almost an hour or so. And they can go back again. So they can actually, you know, eat and drink, then go back prone. So that is very useful. And uh, this is actually from uh, the Lancet, uh, which had produced, uh, uh, published an article on, uh, you know, self-proning and uh, use of, uh, CPAP mask. So this is uh, the you know helmet being used uh, along with uh, the oxygenation, and uh, 
they have shown great improvement. So it has uh, been scientifically proven that uh, the high flow oxygenation does actually uh, work. Uh, so here is uh, how the prone positioning actually work. And you can actually see on the top is the A and B are uh, the scans of patients and the supine position. And you can see increased density at the basis. And when you actually prone the position over time, you can actually see improvement. And why does this improvement happen? And this can be described by something called uh, the uh, alveolar opening pressure. So this is actually normal. This patient is not prone. Uh, so as the perfusion decreases uh, with height is in it. Uh, so uh, at the uh, uh, non-dependent area, uh, ventilation is better. Uh, whereas the perfusion is reduced. So there is mismatch of ventilation perfusion at the top and at the bottom. And it's only in the middle uh, where the uh, there is better uh, you know, matching of the perfusion and ventilation. But it actually changes completely. So this is the line uh, above which you increase. Uh, so below, below this line, uh, you need to increase uh, airway opening pressure so you require high pressures to open up uh, the collapsed alveoli and what happens in the prone position is uh, that the perfusion and ventilation can you actually see that even at the top okay or at the bottom there is a better uh, matching of the ventilation perfusion also if you actually see the tissues of which are actually below the airway opening pressure that amounts are reduced uh, when the patients are prone. So this leads to better recruitment of the alveoli, like a better oxygenation, a better perfusion. So this principle is used uh, in for any kind of uh, respiratory problems where there is increased amount of uh, the uh, uh, you know, fluid within the lungs. That's what is happening. That's what is causing the ground glass uh, appearance uh, uh, in, the, in the lungs. So other therapies which have actually we mentioned is, is can we actually reintroduce carbon dioxide? Oh no, you're not going to breathe into a, into a bag to increase CO2. But can we actually, uh, you know, along with the oxygen, actually supply uh, some CO2? Or, uh, or intermittently, uh, maybe reduce the flows to the level that there is rebreathing of carbon dioxide. Uh, this is actually postulated to increase the CO2 level within the system. Okay, It's important to maintain the CO2. Um, it's a balance between whether uh, we can actually improve oxygenation uh, with increasing CO2. It should, if you look at the uh, alveolar gas equation, uh, rise in CO2 should, should actually drop the PO2. But then we are actually increasing FiO2. So PiO2 into FiO2, that is massively increased. Uh, so the increase in CO2 is not going to uh, reduce oxygen. That is only important when you're breathing air, uh, but in normal patient, it wouldn't. The other is the use of astazolamide. Okay. Astazolamide, um, that has not been used uh, uh, in COVID patients, but uh, this can actually dampen up CO2 and increase PaCO2. Uh, again, experimental. Uh, then, uh, stimulating the respiration, isn't it? So, doxapram, can we, we know that the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, chemoreceptors have been, peripheral chemoreceptors have been hijacked by COVID. So, even hypoxia does not lead to, uh, you know, stimulating the uh, respiratory center. So, can we actually stimulate it uh, by uh, uh, you know artificial means, so uh, giving uh, doxapram infusion uh, to st stimulate the respiration, it acts at the central level. Uh, it's also known as the chemical ventilator. Can we actually use that? Maybe that is something again which can be tried, but hasn't been tried. So SARS-CoV has uh, challenged clinicians throughout the world and uh, um, the academicians uh, globally. Yeah, and this is because of unique pattern of symptoms presented. They say, how can patients be happy with hypoxia? But like I've explained, uh, to put it in simply, uh, it is all to do with the cerebral blood flow and CO2. Uh, so the key here uh, to, the, to the conundrum is the carbon dioxide. So as long as the carbon dioxide levels are actually maintained, they will uh, keep the uh, cerebral blood flow uh, going, uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure is maintained, 
So do not allow the uh, blood pressure to drop in these patients. Do not allow CO2 to drop. Okay, hyperventilation where CO2 drops is not good. You need to maintain uh, the carbon dioxide. If some amount of uh, uh, respiratory, uh, uh, you know, uh, residuals occur, doesn't doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Okay, you need to maintain that. And it is known that these patients can be encouraged to actually breathe. It's not that they can't actually, uh, you know, breathe better so or have deeper breathing exercise. And that's why uh, there is so much stress down on our deep breathing exercises. They can be, even though uh, the, uh, you know, the COVID has hijacked your chemoreceptors and you tend to breathe shallow. Shallow breathing will also actually not only, uh, you know, uh, reduce your oxygenation, but it will it will actually also cause atelectasis in patients. Uh, so it's important to actually maintain uh, your, uh, you know, deep breathing exercises. Uh, and it's not difficult to actually, uh, you know, treat these patients. And out can, out, outcomes can be improved if we actually integrate uh, our knowledge of physiology uh, to your treatment in COVID patients. So it's not uh, just about uh, giving them dexamethasone, uh, remedies, uh, sewer, uh, and antivirals. Okay, it's it's about actually basic physiology, how to maintain oxygenation uh, within the system. And like I said, the key here is maintain the CO2. Okay, the key is CO2. And that will likely maintain their, uh, you know, mentation. These patients will be able to follow your commands. That is the best thing about COVID here that the patients are hypoxic, but they will listen to you. So you can actually treat that. Take it, make it as your advantage. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. And we'll try to see if we can actually follow this up uh, with some uh, uh, question answer sessions.